All right, I'm going to jump into it so we don't go too long. <clears throat> First of all, for the uh, final, I posted some questions. If you go to announcements, it is right here. And I'm going to add to that after... Um, I'm going to add to that now, like after a class, I'm going to add the questions from respiratory system. So the final exam will be about 15, uh, 15 questions. I will take eight from this test bank or this, this file. I'll take like eight or nine from there, maybe 10, right? Eight to 10. Okay. Let's say I'll take actually 10 would be good. I'll take 10 questions from these questions that I'm sending you. So 10 of the questions, 10 of the questions you're gonna know exactly what they are. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna highlight them, copy them, paste them on to uh, So 10 of those questions, you're gonna know exactly what they are. Um, it's going to be make sure you guys are muted by the way um it's going to be unless you have questions and then the other five are going to come from digestive system which we're talking about today and um electrolytes slash urinary it's just going to be a quick um a quick run through of that so um Yeah, so here in this, um, I'm here, I'm saying that I will use some of these questions, probably eight out of the total 15. I'm going to add the respiratory questions into there today. And so, you know, that'll be, that'll be 10 total. I'm going to use 10 out of the questions that, um, that will be in this, um, this attachment. So let me go to the latest quiz. All right, process by which a person breathes in and out. Um, you know, I just wanted to know what the factors were for, for inhalation. And I wanted, so I'm looking for the, the diaphragm flattening, the external intercostals. Both of those are going to increase the volume of the lungs. That'll decrease the pressure. For breathing out, that's just pretty much elastic recoil. If you put more, that's fine, but um, elastic recoil is enough. And then I'm asking you which of the three laws pertain to that. Uh, and it's, uh, it's Boyle's law. So as the volume increases, the pressure decreases. So breathing in is about increasing the volume of your lungs. Then the second question asks you about the um, that was, I think, the last slide, or the last slides, the factors um, contributing to the affinity of oxygen for hemoglobin. So they were um, heat, and as heat goes up, the affinity for hemoglobin decreases. Um, pH, as the pH goes down, that means more acidic, the affinity decreases. As uh, biphosphoglycerate levels go up, BPG levels go up, the affinity is decreased. And then lastly, fourth, the um, carbon dioxide levels. So as we have increasing levels of carbon dioxide, um, you will find um, decreasing affinity. So oxygen will break away from hemoglobin more readily. 
usually when you have an accre increased acidity, you're also going to have, or when you have increased carbon dioxide, you're also going to have increased, uh, you're going to have acidosis. Three laws pertaining to the respiratory function. The first one was, we've already talked about it, Boyle's law. And that's the inverse relationship between volume and pressure. Dalton's law is that each gas has its own independent pressure that it exerts. And then uh, Henry's law is about the proportion of a gas dissolving in a liquid, or you could say the proportion of oxygen dissolving in blood. I mean, it's, it's essentially the same thing. Um, it's dependent on the partial pressure of the gas and the um, partial pressure of the gas and the solubility of the liquid. Some of these laws, I like two of the laws I built into other questions, right? So, you know, if you get, if you got question number um, three, then you'll probably get a couple of the other ones. Um, carbon dioxide transport in the blood. Some of it goes through plasma. Some of it attaches to um, the amino acid group in proteins, the amino acid functional group in proteins. But most of it uses, um, so you have carbon amino compounds, you have um, the plasma, but most of it is through uh, bicarbonate. So it attaches, um, it forms uh, bicarbonate ions, and then it dissociates again later on by the lungs in it. So carbon dioxide is attaching to water and it's making an, uh, a type of acid and then it dissociates again at the lungs where the carbon dioxide leaves. Um, can you guys hear me? Because someone just called me. I want to make sure it's not you guys. Uh, just hit something in the chat if you cannot, if you can hear me. Judy, can you hear me? Give a thumbs up as I can see. Okay. All right. Just all right. So I know that you guys. All right. Um. Um. Why is the air thin in the mountains? Because the pressure of oxygen is lower, and that's Henry's law. So hopefully that was easy for you to answer. The partial pressure of oxygen in, in um, oxygenated blood is around 100. If you put 105, 100, that's all fine, right? And then um, in, in deoxygenated blood, the pressure of oxygen is about 40 millimeters of mercury. For carbon dioxide, it's gonna be higher in the deoxygenated blood. There it's about 45. And then in the oxygenated blood, the amount of carbon dioxide is lower. It's about 40. So, um, and then that all moves around by diffusion. Right? Higher to lower pressure. That's how gases move. That's how liquids move. Um, aside from tidal volume, what are some other volumes used in pulmonology? That goes back to that slide where we had Tidal volume was kind of like in the middle, and then above that was inspiratory reserve, and then expiratory reserve. Um, so that is, you know, the maximum amount of um, of air you can get into your lungs after a normal breath. That's like inspiratory reserve, and then expiratory reserve is the same thing, but breathing out. Um, tidal volume. That was the only one where I was really interested in the number. So that's half a liter, right? Five hundred milliliters. That's roughly tidal volume. Functions, so the next question that, I'm not gonna go over it because that was from the quiz, functions of antibodies. The next one, all four methods of the second line of defense, the only way that that question is different is that instead of three, it was four. And then the last question is a little bit 
yeah, that one's I didn't ask. Um, and it's just essentially that, um, you know, B cells are going to recognize the antigen. They get the stimulus from, um, you know, interleukin-2 from the helper T cells or T4 cells. And then they are going to clone into plasma cells. And it's the plasma cells that uh, secrete antibodies. Does anyone have any questions on these? You can always type them in too. So, um, okay, I'm going to jump into the PowerPoint. So, digestive system. And there it is. So the digestive system, it's divided in, there's, there's two parts to it. <clears throat> the first part we call the GI tract or the gastrointestinal tract. It's one tube. It starts with the mouth. It ends with the anus. It's, um, so, you know, here's the mouth and the nose. And this region in here we call the pharynx. Right there. So this region is the pharynx. I have another slide on it. Um, oh, we talked about this actually. So I'm just going to blow through it. Right. It was what I was talking about. Um, so gastrointestinal tract, and then there's accessory organs. Right. So um, we're going to we're going to talk about these as we go through. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about the accessory organs up in the mouth, which are your teeth, your tongue, and your salivary glands. I'm not really going to focus on that. But once we get down to the abdomen the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder. I'll talk about that. So I've got a slide coming up on that. So we talked about this, the layers, and I think I made a I made no, I didn't make a slide on it. Um, there's four layers, um, mucosa, and the mucosa on anything is going to be the most inner layer. So mucosa is right here. Then submucosa, this grayish part. And notice in the submucosa, see these glands? So like these are mucus glands. And so there's, there's nerves going to the submucosa. That's what this yellow part is supposed to represent. All these yellow things are supposed to represent nerves. So if you see the nerves here, some of these nerves are going into the muscle. So this is the third layer, the muscularis. So some of the nerves are going to the muscle. Some of the nerves are innervating or going to the um, submucosa. So the submucosa, these are like the mucus glands. And then this is the muscle that, you know, causes motility, that makes the food move around. So that's what this is. So that's what the enteric nervous system is. There's... A plexus is like a network of uh, nerves. And um, first of all, since this is the digestive system, this is always going to be parasympathetic innervation. So sympathetic fight or flight, this is not. This is rest and digest. So this is always going to be, there's no sympathetic when it has to do with the digestive system. So, um, so you have the myenteric plexus and the submucosal plexus. So I'm going back here. Myenteric, the MY means like muscle. So that's the myenteric plexus here. And then the submucosal plexus is going to the mucus glands in the, in, in the submucosa. So the myenteric plexus is going to cause the smooth muscle to contract in your digestive system. You have this smooth muscle all through your GI tract. It's in your esophagus, stomach, intestine. So motility means like moving, moving the food through your GI tract. But also we have the submucosal plexus, right? And that's, that's going to the submucosa and that's going to make uh, secretions, like mucosal secretions. This is a, 
a side view, uh, sagittal uh, section, and it's not really a good one, but it's trying to show you this thing called peritoneum. So peritoneum, and let me just kind of move ahead to the, I think I've got a slide on it. Um, I'll come back to these. So peritoneum is a membrane. Just like for your heart, you have the pericardium surrounding the heart. And with the lungs, it's the pleural membrane. With the abdomen, it's called peritoneum. And sometimes it just partially covers organs. Sometimes it completely covers organs, but it's covering organs in your abdomen. So there's different ones. So the greater peritoneum, I mean, the greater omentum is the first type and it's right here. So if you cut into the abdomen and open up the abdomen, this is the first thing you're gonna see. You're actually not going to see the small intestine here. So this greater omentum is, is like an apron that covers your small intestine. It's, it's, uh, it also covers part of your, so this is your, your colon right here. This is part of your, your large intestine right up here. But there's a bunch of small intestine in here and it's getting covered by the greater omentum. This right here, so here's your liver. So this is your diaphragm up here. So your diaphragm is kind of separating your thoracic cavity from your abdominal cavity. So here's the, here's the diaphragm up at the top. Let me let this person in. So your diaphragm's at the top and you can see right in the middle there, a little white thing. So that's called the falciform ligament. That is suspending the um, that's suspending the liver from the that's suspending the liver from the um, diaphragm. So that's pretty much it looks like it's bisecting the liver, and it sort of is. The liver has like many lobes to it, but if you kind of look at it quick, it looks like that thing is separating two big parts of the liver. And so that's what, you know, this is your liver. And so it looks like it's separating it, but it's not so much that it's, it's suspending, it's holding your liver to your diaphragm. And then there's another one, which I'm going to show you on the next slide called the lesser omentum. And it's like right underneath your stomach. So there's the lesser omentum. I'm sorry, right above your stomach. There's the lesser omentum. It's, it's suspending the stomach and part of your, so this is the stomach. This is the beginning of your small intestine. So we're using the word duodenum or duodenum. So here's your small intestine and here's your stomach. So this lesser omentum is suspending this from the liver. See, so like everything doesn't just fall out. If you cut open the abdomen, it doesn't all just come out. Right. This, it's all being held by peritoneum, right? The greater omentum is holding all of this small intestine in. The lesser omentum is holding the stomach to the liver. The falciform ligament is holding the liver to the diaphragm. The small intestine doesn't just all unravel. So it doesn't just all come out, right? The small intestine is held to itself by something we call mesentery. So if you take the small intestine and you start to pull some of it out, you'll see like this webbing, right? So it's held to itself and it's held to the abdomen, the abdomen wall. It's held by mesentery. So it won't just all spill out either. And then finally, you cannot see it, but there's something called mesocolon mesocolon it's binding the colon to the abdominal wall so this is your colon aka large intestine right it comes up here comes across here and it goes down here so what they've done is that they've lifted this this uh, greater momentum up 
because the greater momentum's here, it's like an apron. It's been lifted up. So there it is. So now you're seeing small intestine, but you notice that the mesentery holds the small intestine kind of together so it doesn't just all unravel. The mesocolon is behind this, and it's holding this to the posterior abdominal wall. So those are different peritoneums. They get infected sometimes. They get um, inflamed. It's a very common thing. When someone has it, if you just touch their pinky to their abdomen, they're going to like scream in pain. But it's something that you will like, run into. So these are the five different types of peritoneum. So they're just membranes. Um, if you were to look at the kidneys, um, the kidneys are on your abdominal wall. They're covered, it's called retroperitoneal. They're covered like only on one end. So the front of the kidney is like covered with a membrane and that's kind of like held to the abdominal wall. So it looks like a cyst. Some people think it's like a big cyst, right? But if you cut that peritoneum away and pull that membrane off, then you see like a regular looking kidney. So we call that retroperitoneal. <clears throat> right. I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to test, I'm not going to test you at all on the mouth because I don't have time to get it all in there. But you know, there's the teeth, there's the mouth. This dangly thing right here is the uvula. When you swallow, this is going to go block your nasal passages so food doesn't go up into your nasal tract. This, um, these things we call frenulums. But this right here, so you have like openings for your um, the salivary glands. You've got one here. You've got one like down here on the, like the floor of your mouth, and then you've got ones on the side. Uh, so, and I, I'm not going to test you on them, so I don't have time to get to them. But these are the parotids. They're on the side. Um, they're probably most likely to become like impacted or like blocked. So you have a parotid gland here with ducts. You have a sublingual, lingual for tongue, and submandibular. For mandible so you've got three sets of um, salivary glands and your saliva is pretty much water to make most of its water 99% of your saliva is water it's going to make the food moist but there's some other things in your, your saliva as well there's um, some enzymes and some other stuff which we don't really have time to get into <clears throat> so you chew the food and chewed up food, we call that a bolus. A bolus is just a mass of something. So sometimes a bolus has to do with um, like IV, like fluids, um, an embolus. That's it. But a bolus is just a mass of something. So in the case of food, a bolus is like chewed up food. And so this slide is about swallowing. Deglutition is the act of swallowing. Mastication is the act of chewing, deglutition is the act of swallowing. And so swallowing, you know, how is it that we swallow? Um, you know, our tongue pushes that food up, up to our soft palate, up to the back of your mouth. And then you've got receptors. You've got receptors up back there. So there's receptors in the back of your um, oropharynx, the back of your mouth. And... Um, that is going to the brainstem, to the medulla oblongata. And then there's nerves going back from your brainstem back to your a couple places. Back to muscle, muscle in your, in your, um, in your pharynx, in, in, in the back of your mouth, in your esophagus. It's going to that muscle. And it's also going to the epiglottis, which I'm gonna show you on the next slide. It's going to the epiglottis. And it's going to the uvula. So the uvula is that dangly thing in your throat that's going to block your nasal passages. The epiglottis is down in your trachea. So here's the epiglottis. And the epiglottis is going to close over the – it's going to block the trachea. So the food has to go down the 
um, the esophagus. So there, you know, this is the picture here. This, this is, you know, the, the, the receptors for swallowing are like, you know, this is supposed to be your tongue here. It's kind of hard to look at it the way they have it, this, this sagittal cut, but the receptors are like back in here. Right, and so it's gonna make your uvula go up to block the nasal passages. It's gonna make this epiglottis go down to block the trachea. And then the bolus, the food, has no choice but to go down the epiglottis, I mean the esophagus. So once the food's in the esophagus, the upper part, the very upper part of the esophagus, we have control over it. It's skeletal muscle. But the rest of it is smooth muscle. We have no control over it. And so what happens is that you've got two layers of muscle in your GI tract. You've got circular muscle and you have longitudinal muscle. So some, some muscle is circling around the esophagus. Some muscle is running up and down. Longitudinal runs up and down. Circular circles. They're going to alternate in their contractions. And that's going to help the food move down. So we call that peristalsis. So that's the esophageal stage. So pharyngeal stage just means the food's in your pharynx, like the back of your mouth, as far as you could, you know, reach something into your into your mouth, as far back as you can go. That's all your your um, pharyngeal area, your pharynx. Then when the food gets into your esophagus, then we have peristalsis. Peristalsis is just the alternating contractions of your smooth muscle. I'll go turn that up. Hold on. So that's peristalsis. So the food, so here's your esophagus. And the esophagus is just a hallway because uh, we need to get the food from your mouth down to your abdomen, down to your stomach, right? But your you know, your heart and your lungs are kind of in the way, so we got to get it past all that. So that's what the, um, you know, that's what the esophagus is for. And at the bottom of the esophagus, like right here where, the, where my pointer is, and I'm on, the, I'm on the left thing right now, that's a sphincter, right? And they're calling it right here lower esophageal sphincter. And so sphincter... You have them in a few places in your digestive system. It's just like a closed fist. It's like your anal sphincter. That's a sphincter, right? So it's a closed fist. It, it opens up and it lets food by and then it closes again, right? And so this one that you're looking at once I get back to the, the slide, this one that you're looking at, they're calling it lower esophageal sphincter. Um, a better word or more act well, a more commonly used word is the cardiac sphincter. So this is the cardiac sphincter here where it's pointing. Lower esophageal or cardiac. It's going to open up, let the food into the stomach, and then it's going to close again. And they... I don't care about you knowing necessarily the regions of the stomach. I'm not going to test you on knowing the regions of the stomach. But just like FYI, this, reg this region at the top here is called the cardia. And that's why they call the sphincter that's right here that they're not really showing it to you. But there's a sphincter here called the cardiac sphincter. It's not – it doesn't really have to do with like the heart. It's just because this region is called the cardia. Although I will say it does have to do with the heart in, in, in the sense that, so there's acid here. This is all acid in your stomach. And that this sphincter is to prevent the acid from flowing up into the esophagus. So the stomach has a thick layer of mucus that protects it. So otherwise the acid would burn through the epithelial cells. It burned through the lining of the stomach. But, the, um, but it's got a layer of mucus protecting it. But the esophagus doesn't have it. 
And so when that acid flows back into the esophagus, that's why we call it heartburn or uh, esophageal reflux or GERD or whatever you want to call it. But it can mimic um, it can mimic heart problems, like a heart attack or something. Because, you know, your heart's here and then your stomach's like right about here. And I don't know if like my camera's showing it, but the esophagus coming up. So your esophageal sphincter is somewhere around here. The apex of your heart is like really close to it. And so it's a, a very common thing where people will have heartburn and they will uh, interpret it as a heart attack. It's also a common thing, not as common, but to have a heart attack and interpret it as um, reflux or, or heartburn, right? And then it's sometimes with, with heart attacks, people throw up and then they feel better. And that's a very, you know, that's, it's intuitive that that, that would be um, something digestive, right? Oh, my, my, my esophagus was burning. I threw up. I felt better. That must have been the pasta sauce I ate, right? Whereas really... It's like a horrible sign, you know, it's like not a good heart attack. Um, but they call anyway, this is a sphincter here that they call it the cardiac sphincter. And then there's this region at the other end, they call the pylorus. And so there's another sphincter right here on the other end of the stomach called the pyloric sphincter or the pyloric valve. And that is going to prevent all the food from going too quickly into the small intestine. So this is the end of the stomach here. This is the beginning of the small intestine. You don't want the food to just move really quick into the small intestine. So this sphincter, this ring of muscle, is to regulate the passage of food to make it go slow. <clears throat> the sphincter up here at the top is to prevent backflow. So they've got two different re reasons for being there. <clears throat> as far as the, all this other stuff, I don't care about the regions of the stomach. I do want you to see something else though. So look at the muscularis. Remember the muscularis is the third layer. Mucosa, submucosa, then the muscularis. So the muscularis, the whole GI tract has two layers of muscle, circular and longitudinal. The exception is the stomach. The stomach has a third layer. It's got an oblique layer or diagonal layer. So, so there's three layers to the stomach. So I just wanted you to see that it, the stomach has a third layer of muscle, oblique or diagonal, circular, longitudinal because it's the nature of what the stomach does. The stomach is taking your food and it's liquefying it. <clears throat> so if you're, if you eat like a box of pizza crust and croutons, your, your stomach's going to liquefy that and it's turning it into liquid because we want to turn it into liquid because we want to get all the good stuff out of the food. Right. But, um, to do that, you know, this has to be really acidic. So this is all, let me see, this is a better slide. So it's dropped, the food, here's your esophagus, the food drops in, this is all like an acid bath, right? It's all a bunch of hydrochloric acid and it's sloshing back and forth. <clears throat> so to make that food slosh back and forth, you need like extra muscle in there because uh, that food's getting manhandled, right? It's just getting pushed around in, a lot of um, a lot of acid, and that's going to physically break down food. So that's the main job of your stomach is to physically break down food. So when you think about how food gets broken down, there's two ways. You got to physically break the food down, and you have to chemically break the food down. So if you were on a liquid diet and you're just drinking um, milk and sugar, things like that. Right. Physically, that or mechanically, that's already liquid. So your stomach actually wouldn't have a whole lot of work on that end, but you still have to chemically break it down. The, the sugars that are the starch that's, that's in that liquid 
the molecules too too large for your body and the pieces of fat even though it's liquid it's still too large and the proteins are too large so you could have liquid protein like you could take a protein powder and make a liquid drink with it but the molecules are too large you have to break all these molecules down into like very small units so that we can get it into the bloodstream so your stomach is doing mostly mechanical digestion or physical it's like breaking it up and and liquefying your food it really looks more like um like those icy drinks you used to get at Kmart, like a slushy drink. It's more like that, but anyway. So um, pyloric, our um, cardiac sphincter is on this end and pyloric sphincter, it's a pretty good shot of it here. And that's what the stomach does. Here I'm looking at the mucosa of the stomach. In other words, we're looking at so here's the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and serosa is like this gray layer at the bottom, very large, at, very, at the very bottom. Um, what I what I want you to see is the um, the mucosa. So you see the lining of the stomach, and notice that it's not like nice and smooth. The stomach, there's a bunch of pits in the stomach. So the stomach, the mucosa of the stomach forms gastric pits. And if you see these cells, they look like, well, they're epithelial cells. And what kind of epithelial cells do they look like to you? Either cuboidal or columnar, right? Because they're definitely not flat. So they're columnar cells. The important thing about it is that there's different types of cells here. Like some of them are like different colors. So if you look down here where my pointer is, there's like different colors. And that's just telling you that there's different types of cells. Oh, there we go. That's easier. So here's a gastric pit. There's different cells in here that do different things. And we're gonna take these two cells right here and just kind of put them together. They're mucus cells. So some of these cells make mucus. And that mucus is going to line the stomach and protect the stomach from acid. Otherwise, if the acid is, is touching all these, these columnar cells, it's going to degrade them, right? You're going to burn a hole in your stomach. You're going to get an ulcer. So you, you don't want to, you can ulcerate your stomach. You can get an ulcer in your esophagus. You can get an ulcer in your small intestine. So both sides of the stomach can get ulcers. If the stuff from the stomach ends up in the esophagus or too much of it ends up in the small intestine, too much at one time, you could start to burn a hole and, and, and get an ulcer. But anyway, um, that's what the mucus cells do, secrete mucus, exactly what it says here. Some of these cells are parietal cells. Parietal cells are going to um, make the acid. So hydrochloric acid, that's the acid of your stomach. Your stomach has a pretty low pH. The pH of your stomach is around two. So remember the lower number you go, the more acidic it is. So um, neutral is around seven, your stomach is around two. And each time I go from seven to six, that's times 10. If I go to seven to five, it's times 100. So it's really acidic. So the parietal cells are what's making that. Then you have chief cells. Chief cells are making an enzyme, a special enzyme um, called, well, two special enzymes. One's called pepsin. And pepsin is an enzyme that breaks up proteins. Lipase is an enzyme that breaks up lipids. They put it on this slide, but gastric lipase is not really, you know, it's not really effective in the stomach, but whatever. All right, so pepsin. Pepsin's like the, the big enzyme made by the stomach. Normally, enzymes could never handle something so acidic, but pepsin is, is an exception to the rule. So pepsin works on proteins. It, it breaks up, it like chemically breaks down proteins. 
And then lastly, you have this thing called the G cell. We'll talk about gastrin um, later. It's a later slide. So pepsin, I, I'm talking about pepsin, but then we see right here, it's, it's something called pepsinogen. So remember the O-G-E-N means that it's inactive. So pepsinogen is an inactive form of pepsin because pepsin is an enzyme that breaks up proteins. So if you were to release pepsin right here in this pit, the pepsin would turn around and start dissolving all these cells, right? So you, you want to make it inactive. And so the pepsinogen is going to go up this pit and it's going to go into the lumen of the stomach, you know, where all the liquid is. And then the acid, the acid of the stomach will activate the pepsinogen and turn it into pepsin. So just remember, if you see an OGEN, it's inactive. Remove the OGEN, and then that's the active form. So stomach's going to, you know, sl slosh all this back and forth. Um, it's going to, you know, break it down, physically break it down, and turn it into, into chyme, which is like an important word that I forgot to... Um, put on any of these slides. Chyme is spelled C-H-Y-M-E. So the bolus is what enters the stomach, you know, chewed up food. The, the slushy liquefied food, when it leaves the stomach, we call it chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. And it's chyme that's going to enter the small intestine. So the function of the stomach is to turn the bolus into chyme. So now the food's going to enter the small intestine. Why is all being laid? Or kicked out? Oh, kicked out. Sorry, you got kicked out. All right. So, um, you know what, let's stop for a minute and see, let me ask if you have any questions. Cause I, I know, I know I'm blowing through this. If you feel like it seems like I'm moving faster than normal, I sort of am. Um, I already have everything that I want to talk to you about on these slides, right? So I might even go over it again a little bit on, um, Wednesday, but I am trying to, um, get through it. And I could go like two hours, but I feel like I'm losing you. I feel like there's a we have a shelf life as as um, students, and that's about well about this long to be honest. It's about 45 minutes, and then I'll lose most of you. But I'm going to keep plugging ahead. Any questions? I know I'm going fast. So we're on the stomach. We're done with the stomach. The stomach liquefies your food because we want to get all the good stuff out of it. The small intestine is where the stuff gets absorbed. And there is a little bit of a small intestine right here. So we call that the duodenum. Let me see if I got, let me go to the back to the first slide here. So the, 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 Esophagus, it's a hallway. Stomach, liquefy your food. Small intestine, that's all this area right here. And it starts right, like you see where my pointer is? It's like right here. So this is the beginning of the small intestine. And it drops behind this piece of the large intestine here. It drops behind it, and then there it is. And so there's three parts to this small intestine. Jejunum, ileum, Duodenum. Don't worry about the jejunum and ileum. We don't have time for that. Duodenum is a very common uh, way to say the small intestine. The duodenum or duodenum, I'm underlining it here with my pointer. That's the first part of the small intestine. That's where most of the absorption happens. So that's the main job of the small intestine, absorb. 
So you have it's it's chemical breakdown and absorption. So the food's pretty much liquefied at this point. We have to chemically break it down and um, make everything small as we can. For example, starch. Like if you take, um, you know, like um, bread and you chew on the bread and you can make it liquefied or you're, you're eating goldfish crackers, that's starch, right? And you chew on it and your stomach liquefies it. It's too big. Even though it's liquid, starch is too big to absorb into your bloodstream. So you have to turn it into glucose. You have to make it even smaller. And this happens in your small intestine. So chemical breakdown, but more importantly, um, absorption. So this is where everything gets absorbed. So we're at the small intestine now. Um, so here's the stomach. Here's the, here's the duodenum. See, so you're following it over here, and then it's all this stuff, right? And so um, then the large intestine, by the way, when we get to it, is going to take back the water. It's going to reclaim as much water as possible. That's what the large intestine does. So the small intestine we know is going to absorb. This is where everything gets absorbed into your bloodstream. So before we get to that, I want to talk about a few accessory organs. So the accessory organs that we have down in your um, abdomen are your liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. What you can't, what's been removed is the stomach. The stomach's like right here where I'm, I'm kind of circling it. So when you want to see the pancreas in someone, you got to like take the stomach and lift it up and the pancreas is underneath. So, um, so if you notice, if you look at the pancreas, this is like a, there's like a tube, a duct inside the pancreas. And if you follow it, there's actually two openings here. So it leads into the, small intestine same thing with the liver so the liver is making bile it's making something and and there's a bunch of ducts and you follow it down now following this green thing down and it's also emptying into the small intestine and then finally the gallbladder which is storing bile and i have that on a slide um it's going down this duct, the cystic duct, and it's going into the small intestine as well. So the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas are all secreting things, putting it into the small intestine. So that's why we call them accessory organs. Like it's not part of that one tube, that GI tract, but they're also helping. And so I put a list right here, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. So the liver, the liver does lots of things. We don't have enough time to spend on the liver, but it's, you know, does a lot of things. Here, it makes bile. One of the things that it does is that it makes bile. And bile takes big fat drops and makes them into small fat droplets so that the enzymes can then break it up. So the main enzyme that breaks up fat is called lipase. Lipase for lipids. And before lipase can work, the drops of fat are too big. They have to be made smaller. So that's what bile does. The gallbladder just holds on to bile. Because you're making bile all the time, but you might not be eating fats all the time. So when that's the case, that bile is going to be stored in the gallbladder until it's needed. And then when you eat like a good amount of fat, then your gallbladder is going to contract and push some of that bile into your small intestine. So the bile is made here by the liver. It looks to you here like this liver is two lobes. It's actually many lobes. Um, but that makes the bile and then the gallbladder stores extra bile. 
the pancreas makes two types of things. One, digestive enzymes. So enzymes that chemically break down our food. The second thing that it makes is bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate. And bicarbonate is bicarbonate is a um, like an antacid. Well, it's it's like baking soda. It's baking soda, right? Baking soda can be used as an antacid, right? Your pancreas makes it. So coming from here, the stomach's not here, but imagine the stomach's here. And so coming from here is a pH of like two, right? That's way too intense for the small intestine. So coming from the pancreas is bicarbonate with a pH of like eight. So they're going to kind of buffer each other. Right, so you need the antacid to be made by the pancreas. Otherwise, that's too much acid for your small intestine. So the pancreas produces bicarbonate and it produces digestive enzymes. So there are a lots of there's lots of enzymes that the pancreas makes. And I just I put a list here, and you know, the list could be for later. You don't have to worry about the list right today, but there it is. So these are enzymes. These are some of the enzymes that are made by the pancreas. And next to it, I put what we call the substrate. The substrate is the thing that the enzyme works on. Amylase breaks up starch, lipase lipids. And then the other four, deal with proteins. Your body spends a lot of energy. So there's three types of energy that you eat, right? You're eating carbohydrates, lipids, or proteins. That's, that's pretty much your energy sources in food. So all the food you eat can be, can, you know, it's, it's, they're one or the other. So out of carbs, lipids, and proteins, the, your body spends the most time working on proteins. It takes your body more energy and more effort to break up proteins. And you can see the example of it here. So we've got an enzyme to break down starch. Starch is a carbohydrate. We have an enzyme to break up lipids, like olive oil or something. And then there's four enzymes that break up um, proteins. So proteins are the most satiating of the foods you can eat. Like if you want something that'll make you feel full for the least amount of calories, your best bet is to go with a protein. And the worst thing for you to do is to go with a um, lipid. Lipids, simple sugars, so like Twinkies, uh, uh, cake icing, you know, something that's just like sugar and fat that is, it's like, it's not gonna make you feel full. And it's, fat has like almost twice the amount of calories by weight that than, than carbohydrates or proteins do. But anyway, there's your enzymes made by the pancreas. I know there's a lot. There's six there. There's a seventh enzyme that we talked about from your stomach, pepsin. So there's seven. Here's six. Add the enzyme from your stomach. That's seven. And um, then there's three more right here. So pepsin is the seventh. And then there's three more that are made by your small intestine. So your pancreas makes enzymes, your small intestine makes a few enzymes. Don't get overwhelmed by it, it's on a slide. This thing's getting recorded, so just take your time with it. It's not, if you wrote it all on a piece of paper, all 10 of the enzymes and the substrate, you could probably get it all down in 15 minutes. You know lactase, Lactase breaks up lactose. Um, maltase may, breaks up maltose. All right. And then I just put down here this third bullet point. I was just telling you that lipase and amylase are made in a few places. Amylase is made in your saliva, and it's also made by your pancreas. Lipase is made by your pancreas. Um, it is made to your, by your stomach to some degree, and it's even made in your saliva. 
But the main thing is like we have there, you have 10 enzymes and then you have um, the things that those enzymes break down. So um, almost done. The large, the small intestine, it's it, besides chemical breakdown, besides this is where the enzymes mix with your food, it happens in your small intestine. This is also where things are going to get absorbed. Um, let, me let someone in. Give me a second to breathe. Oh, wow. Um, no, I'm going to go for it. I can, I'll wrap this up in five, five minutes or so. Okay. So what's the main function, the main job of your small intestine is to absorb things. It's created to absorb. So this is like a cutaway of your small intestine. It's probably not even with a microscope. I mean, this is what it looks like. Um, it's not smooth. It's got these circular folds. So imagine like a, um, imagine like the ditch in front of it. Well, you guys don't have ditch, if you have a ditch in front of your house, like imagine water flowing through a pipe, right? And that pipe is just kind of sitting horizontally right? And the water's flowing through that pipe. The top part of the pipe doesn't get wet, right? Because all the water's flowing along the bottom part, right? So the small intestine, it doesn't want that because it wants the top part and the bottom part to get liquid. You want to get chyme or liquid. You want all the intestine to get it. So as the Chyme goes through the intestine, it spirals around so that the top part and the bottom part, you know, gravity doesn't dictate that all the fluid is just going to stay at the bottom part of the pipe, right? So as, as the chyme, as that fluid moves through the, through the intestine, it swirls it around. And that's what the circular folds do. It forces that chyme to go to the top part too. It just spirals around as it goes through your intestine. So that way we can all of the intestine gets some of that kind. The other thing is that if you look at the intestine, it's not like the stomach where it's like pits. They're like little fingers. There's like a bunch of little fingers coming out and those increase the surface area. So you have much more of an area here to absorb stuff as opposed to it just being flat. So these cells, these are called villi. Or, or for singular, villus. V i l l i for plural doesn't matter. But, uh, if you look at the villi here or the villus, you see that inside we have blood vessels. We have blood vessels, and even there's a lymphatic vessel. So this is where the absorption is going to happen. If at the tip of, let's say, like my pointer is like a sugar, like a piece of glucose, it's going to squeeze between these epithelial cells and enter the bloodstream. So this is where sugar enters your blood. This is where proteins, amino acids, this is where it enters your bloodstream. This is where fats enter your, remember, lymphatic system. So that's why you see a lymphatic, you know, a capillary here. So a, a lacteal. So this is where the energy and nutrients and stuff from your food enter your bloodstream or your lymphatic system. So the villi increase the surface area. On top of these villi are little microvilli. So right at the top of these cells are microvilli, which even further increase the surface area. We call the microvilli a brush border. Because when you look at it under a microscope, you can't see the villi like it looks like here. It just looks like a brush. So they call it a brush border, but um, that even makes more surface area. Because the idea here is you want to absorb as much stuff as you can. 
So there's three things that make the intestine ideal for absorbing things. Villi, microvilli, and circular folds. That's what, that's how the small intestine is adapted to absorb things. Um, I'm going to kind of leave it there. I'm not going to get to the end of this. There's no way, but I, I'm always pretty close to the end. The, the, the last thing I'm going to skip over this slide for now, and I'm going to skip over that slide. The last thing I just wanted to show you, and I'm not going to go into it, but this is the large intestine. So here's the very end of the small intestine. Here's the beginning of the large intestine. There's your appendix, by the way. The large intestine is going to reclaim water. So remember, if you ate a bunch of croutons and goldfish crackers, your stomach is going to liquefy that food. But your stomach has to donate water. Your body's donating water to this food to be liquefied. So you need that water back. So that's the, the large intestine. As the food moves through here, it it goes from being chyme to feces. And um, there's other things about it, but we really don't have time at all. And so that's it. Reclaims 80 to 90% of the water. And that's it. And then you store it in the rectum and that's it. It goes out. I'm not going to have time to get to these three slides, but um, I'll try to hit on it during the next class. So, I know that's a lot of information. If you could go over the slides, especially these last few slides, and try to get it on your own, and then I'll cover it um, on Wednesday. And um, so I'll probably spend like 10 or 15 minutes, and then we will um, go into a very light um, thing on um, electrolytes and, and the urinary system. They kind of um, go together. So let me... Um, let me stop recording. And and does anybody have any um, questions?